Strength and honor. Strength and honor. Strength and honor. At my signal, unleash hell. What is going on everybody? It is Devin with UPTV and today I wanted to take the time to decode one of the best, if not the best animes ever to be created and that is Dragon Ball Z. Dragon Ball Z is a direct sequel to the Dragon Ball anime created by Akira Toriyama. The show first aired in Japan from 1989 to 1996 before it was actually dubbed for viewing in the United States. Although the show appears to be an innocent action and adventure show for young kids, it was truly created as the ultimate Illuminati propaganda series. In this video, I will be focusing on the Dragon Ball Z series, but in my next video, I will be focusing on the Dragon Ball Super series, which was just recently created and first aired July 5th of 2015. I'm decoding this series for two main reasons. One, Dragon Ball Z is filled with Illuminati symbolism, and I actually couldn't find any videos on YouTube that take the time to point these signs out. My second reason is simply because I want to decode Dragon Ball Super, which I believe is pointing to us being in the last days. In order for me to decode Dragon Ball Super in a way people would understand, I have to first dive into what Dragon Ball Z is really about. Dragon Ball, the series before Dragon Ball Z, is about a young boy named Goku who was sent to the planet Earth by an alien race known as the Saiyans. The lower level Saiyans were sent to other planets to destroy them. This is a clear representation of the fallen angels mentioned in the Bible. Goku was sent as a fallen angel to cause destruction upon the Earth. As a baby, Goku was very, very evil, but one day when he got a head wound sort of like in the Bible when the Antichrist gets a head wound it changes Goku's whole personality no longer the evil fallen angel he was but more like the ultimate happy carefree spirit who lives by no rules but does with thy will snake sounds familiar that knowledge the spirit said to worship me take wine and strange drugs whereof I will tell my prophet Falling on precisely the wrong side of the Bible's account concerning the fall of man and Satan's role, this snake spirit begins the revelation by telling man that he is a god, that reality is essentially an illusion, sin a myth, and that ethically there's no greater commandment than the law of Philema, Greek for will, as famously stated in the 40th verse of chapter 1. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. We do what we want to do when we want to do. And just what is this core principle by which most people live? Well, in a nutshell, do what you want. Surprised? Well, Anton LaVey wasn't. He understood precisely from where this popular concept had arisen. And he must, uh, as a Satanist, knowing this, realizing what his human potential is, eventually, and here is one of the essential points of Satanism, attain his own Godhead in accordance with his own potential. Therefore, each man, each woman, is a god or gods in Satanism. Big Pimper really, man, is living life to your fullest potential. I mean, like... Whatever you want to do, when you want to do it, you do it, but in the grandest way possible, you know? Uh, and for a god or goddess, what's the ultimate standard for ethics, meaning, purpose, and destiny? You've got it. Whatever you feel is right. My heart is the ruler of all my being. If my heart tells me it's true, that's good enough for me. The answers to your, to your problems are in yourself and not in a, not in a god or religion. What, that, what does it mean to whip your hair back and forth? It means like, basically it's the new I'm me. Mm -hmm. It's basically like, you, it's not me, I'm doing what I want to do. Uh-huh. And I'm...
Jubilees is not the only ancient text that gives a different story of creation. There is a forbidden book, lost for centuries, that includes fallen angels, bloodthirsty giants, and a warning to all humanity. Just another lower class warrior child. We'll send him to one of the frontier planets. He's no good to us here. I suppose not. On planet Vegeta, a baby boy cries out for the first time. Little could he know, high in the skies above, both his father and his homeworld are under threat by a fearsome enemy. So it came to be that this child from a faraway planet fell to Earth. Oh dear, I can't very well leave you out here all on your own. <laughs> and thanks to the kindness of a stranger, he would make this new world his home. I think I'll call you Goku. Gohan tried to take care of you, but you were wild, downright uncontrollable, and unusually powerful for a baby. You wanted nothing to do with Gohan's kindness. Then, one day, there was a terrible accident. You fell into a deep ravine and badly injured your head. Your grandfather feared that he had lost you, but somehow, miraculously, you survived. Yes, any other child would have died, but you recovered. And from that day on, you became a happy, loving boy. Although Goku is considered the good guy, he really represents the devil masquerading around as an angel of light. Goku does whatever he wants so much that he is literally the worst husband and father in the entire world. All he cares about is fighting. Even though he has the ability to teach his kids, he never takes the time to even care if they can defend themselves. Goku, like the devil, is literally all about himself and self-love. True fans of Dragon Ball Z would probably try to argue this point by saying he gets his greatest strength by thinking about the people he loves. I assure you that this is also wrong. It's usually after one of his loved ones dies that he then decides to gather more strength through anger. Anger of somebody he has harmed, someone he considers his, it's all about him at the end of the day. Before I dive deeper into Dragon Ball Z, there are a couple things I want to make clear about its predecessor, Dragon Ball. I believe that it is necessary to explain that the Illuminati propaganda did not begin in Dragon Ball Z, it actually began in 1984 when Dragon Ball first aired. Proof of this can be found within episode 1 of the series. In this episode, there is a clear promotion of pedophilia because not only do they show the little boy Goku naked with his private part hanging out, but when Goku meets a young underage girl named Boma, he lifts up her skirt and looks at her butt. He claimed to be checking to see if she had a tail. Nope. Besides my grandpa, you're the only human being that I've ever seen. Uh? But Grandpa told me about girls. He told me that if I ever ran into a girl, that I should be as polite as I possibly could. I see. Well, what a nice thing to say. Your Grandpa sounds like a very wise man, is he? Well, he was. He died a long time ago. Huh? Shame on you! What do you think you're doing? I was just checking to see if you had a tail. In another scene in the first episode, Boma offers to show Goku her underwear if he gives her the Dragon Ball. As the series goes on, the promotion of pedophilia gets worse. 
Hey, I know what. Look, I'll trade ya. Uh. You let me have your Dragon Ball, and I'll let you have a little peek. What do I care about seeing your dirty old fanny? That looks like a nice soft place to put my head. <laughs> well, good night, Bulma. Uh. Uh. Hey, where'd you put your balls? Now, the Dragon Balls represent the seven deadly sins. That is why it takes seven balls to call upon the dragon or serpent, which happens to be the devil. This is subliminally telling your kids that only the devil can grant your wishes. Not to get too deep, but understand that wishes and blessings are two different things. The devil grants wishes and God blesses us. When a person chooses to sell his soul to the devil, it's because he wants his earthly wishes fulfilled. When they call upon the dragon Shinron to grant their wish after collecting the seven balls, they are really calling upon the devil. They might as well be using a Ouija board instead. I sold my soul to the devil. I know it's a crappy deal. This came with a few toys like a happy meal. The seven deadly sins are promoted throughout the series as well. And if you don't know, the seven deadly sins are as followed. Number one. Envy, the desire to have an item or experience that someone else possesses. My motivation was very different than Kakarot's. My motivation was to be the best, to be the greatest Saiyan alive as I always had been, until Kakarot came into the picture that is. Kakarot's success was like a demon in my head. How could he be a Super Saiyan when I, the prince of all Saiyans, could not? The intensity of my training was maddening. At 450 times normal gravity, a basic training game became a desperate struggle for survival. Even the simplest moves required every ounce of willpower I had. I wasn't sure how long I could sustain the effort without breaking in two. It seemed like the only thing holding my body together was my one desire, to be better than Kakarot. Number two, gluttony, excessive ongoing consumption of food or drink. There you are, sir. You know, I don't think I'll ever get used to this. Man, Goku, you sure eat a lot for a dead guy. You know, that's exactly what King Kai always tells me. But well, what can I say? I just love to eat. Number three, greed, an excessive pursuit of material possessions. Isn't your mommy lucky, Marin? If she wins, she's going to be a millionaire. Yeah! All right! <laughs> uh, I don't want to die! Please don't hurt me! Come on, please! I got a kid! I just want to live! Oh, my! Please! Please! Uh, uh, Shut up or I'll rip uh, your head off. Then I'd be doing you a favor, wouldn't I? Uh, Look at that! A perfect headlock! It looks like Mr. Satan's in trouble! So, do you still want to win this match, big guy? Uh, no, please! No, I don't care about winning! Just don't hurt me! I beg you! Hey, what's going on? Now that you know you can't win, I don't mind letting you have the victory. Uh, that tickles my ear. What? What did you say? I said I wouldn't mind letting you win this match, moron! Uh -huh. All you have to do is give me 20 million zenny for letting you win. Not bad, huh? I think it's a pretty good deal. Especially considering the embarrassing situation you're in. Would you look at this, folks? Wow! Mr. Satan's not moving! What an extraordinary technique this must be to subdue a man of his strength! You... you don't really mean it, do you? Of course I mean it. 
I don't want all the publicity and fanfare. Just give me the 10 million that you'll get for winning this match and another 10 out of your own pocket. But, but... There are other options, you know. You could fight and get knocked out and go home with a big lump on your head without the title. No! Anything but that! Number four, lust. An uncontrollable passion or longing, especially for sexual desire. You see Boma every time you blink! Well, <laughs> So, you gonna help me? <laughs> okay, I'll give you this, but you have to give me something. And what's that? <laughs> A peek at your, uh, underwear. Uh, dirty old man! Well, how about just your bottom half? <laughs> Nice negotiation. Master Roshi, this is not appropriate conduct. Eh? Get off my case, turtle! You think it's easy living on an island with nothing but the boob tube? Huh. Well, if being made into an embarrassing object is what it takes to get my wish, then okay! <laughs> I duped them into thinking this bothers me, and I get an easy dragon ball! Heck, <laughs> underwear's not much different from a bathing suit. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> Oh, okay, that's more than enough. Number five, pride. Excessive view of oneself without regard to others. I refuse! What? Huh? Your business with the Kai, it means nothing to me. Kakarot is my only objective. That's amusing, Vegeta, but I'm serious. By every fiber in your body, I command you to destroy! <laughs> Kill! Kill the guy! No! Get out of my head! I already told you! I will not be distracted from this anymore! I won't! It will take more than head games to stop me! You may have invaded my mind and my body, but there's one thing a Saiyan always keeps! His strong! to me before? Since when can the possessed say no to the possessor? <laughs> Number six, sloth. Excessive laziness or the failure to act and utilize one's talents. Laziness. Being lazy is simply defined as not wanting to work. And in a series like Dragon Ball Z, where you have to work to achieve strength, not many characters would be considered lazy. However, the guy that comes to mind the most is Yajirobe. Every single time in Dragon Ball Z, guys like Goku and Krillin ask him to train to help protect the Earth and grow stronger because if you don't know, Yajirobe is naturally a very strong fighter. He is just very, very lazy. And number seven, wrath and uncontrollable feelings of anger and hate towards another person. There's still plenty of people on Earth that you could kill for your amusement while you're waiting for this fight. Huh? Uh, what? Oh, Piccolo! Be quiet, Dede! Forgive me, but I know that they could be wished back with the Dragon Balls. I know what you're doing. You're assessing how many people are still alive. Does this mean he's going to give us the extra day? Surely it would take him that long to hunt down all of those people? Time to kill. <clears throat> Ah! 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 Ah!
Look! Wow! Ooh, check him out! Fireworks! What's wrong? Is it... Uh oh Yes, the Earth. It's terrible. Oh. He's attacking the entire populace. Human extinction attack. How do you like it? In Dragon Ball, we get to meet the Guardian of Earth whose name is Kami. Kami is an reptilian-like alien who secretly controls Earth. I say secretly because the average person in the series has no clue that there is even a so-called Earth Guardian. Kami is a clear representation of reptilian aliens that control Earth, which is now a common conspiracy theory promoted and exposed mostly by a man named David Icke. David Icke uh, from England. I went through an extraordinary series of what you might call paranormal experiences, not that they were, um, 20 years ago in 1989, uh, and basically the, the veil lifted, and I saw the world in a completely different way, and I started on a journey of research, which has led me over 20 years to a very obvious conclusion that this world is controlled by very very few people uh, behind the people we think are in power and they have a very very malevolent agenda for humanity as a whole who to them are nothing like a cattle. This family bloodline interbreeding control system of these elite families was not just a human thing it went beyond that uh, into uh, entities that are anything but human. And it was only with the, the passage of the years and more and more research when I started to realize the nature of this reality that we're experiencing that that made sense in, in how this structure is playing out. Just outside of the frequency range of visible light, there are entities that are anything but human who have been manipulating this reality, this world, for eons. And because they are working on, operating on a frequency that's, that's different to ours, they have to manipulate our world through conduits, I mean, and interfaces. Uh, for instance, when you see scientists in a laboratory, they want to work with material that's very dangerous. So the material will be in a big glass tank and they will be outside the tank and they'll put on those gloves and they can work from outside the tank into the tank and do what they have to do. It's very, very similar in theme to what these Illuminati bloodlines have been bred for. They are bred to be the vehicles within visible light, this world that we experience, of these entities. And if you go back and you look at religious beliefs, etc., of the, of the ancients and the accounts of the ancients, these entities, which go under different names, some people call them the serpent race, some people call them demonic. In the Islamic culture, they call them jinns. All different names, uh, but the same entities. The bloodlines of interbreeding incessantly and have been right back to ancient Babylon and Sumer and Egypt etc and beyond because they are holding a certain genetic code which allows the possession another ancient ancient common theme from as far back as you can track right to today a, a genetic code which allows these entities to possess these particular bloodline families within the reality that we experience and these uh, families are therefore simply vehicles of these demonic entities. You research any of these families, be it the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, uh, Greenspan, Alan Greenspan, any of these people, you will go eventually into uh, black magic, uh, blood drinking, human sacrifice rituals where they um, make sacrifices to the gods. 
And these gods are these entities which feed off human energy and feed off human blood too. So people accept, yes, uh, oh, long ago people used to do human sacrifice to the gods, yes, and all the rest of it. And they think, oh no, we're kind of civilized now. Well, some of us are, but these bloodlines are not. And they're just continuing to do today covertly what they were openly doing uh, in, in the past. And uh, they are interacting with these entities all the time in their rituals. That's why they do some of all these rituals. That's why they drink the blood. And ultimately, they are possessed by these entities. And this, this brings about a simple situation. You've got the entities, let's call them demonic entities for wonderful word. They're operating just outside of this visible light reality that we experience. They use the bloodline families as their vehicle to manipulate this reality. They take over their mental, what passes for their emotional processes, their physical processes. Um, and what that means is, when these bloodline families go into positions of power, what we're actually doing is seeing these entities go into those positions of power. And so the secret society network is there to manipulate these bloodline families and their agents into the positions that dictate uh, society and the direction it goes and all the rest of it. And because we can only decode their visible light level, we see the human level. We see, we see people under different names called Rockefeller and Rothschild and Bush and Obama and all the rest of it. But if we could see beyond visible light, just a little bit, and some people can, you would see overshadowing these people anything but a human uh, entity. And it's these entities that have passed through what we call history, and they have been the cement, the guiding force that has brought this conspiracy through to the present day. Because people have asked me in the past, quite rightly, I understand it, why would someone give their life to this conspiracy, this global takeover, in 1500 or 1650 or 1820, when they knew they were never going to be around to actually see it happen, which is what they're trying to do now, playing the cards they're playing now. The answer to that is they were just vehicles. This, these entities are the common force passing through history, um, which, is, which, is, which has led this conspiracy to where it is today. What the system has done is to keep from us the nature of the reality we're experiencing and the nature of who we are in life itself. And in doing so, it has kept us completely in the dark about what's actually happening around us. The knowledge that's passed across the top levels of the secret society network through these bloodline families, the most important part of that knowledge is, that, is the knowledge of reality itself. For instance, we think as we look around here that we're seeing everything that exists within this room. But in fact, we're only seeing a frequency range, a very tiny one, called visible light. Anything outside of that, we can't decode, therefore we can't see. But just like radio stations share the same space without interfering with each other, so other worlds, other dimensions, other realms of reality, if you like, share the same space without interfering with each other. However, just as with radio, if you've got two stations that are very close on the dial, then one will be the dominant one, but another one you'll get what we call interference from it. It's the same with these various realities that share the same space. It's what mainstream science calls uh, parallel universe. But you know that if you have a radio in your living room and it's, uh, you have all frequencies in your living room, BBC, Radio Moscow, ABC, but your radio is tuned to one frequency. You're, you're, you're decohered from all the other frequencies. You're only coherent with one frequency. Right. We now believe that the universe is vibrating and that there are vibrations of different universes right in this room. There are the universes of dinosaurs because the comet didn't hit 65 million years ago. They're the wave function of aliens from outer space looking at the rubble that, of an Earth that already was destroyed, all in your living room, except we have decohered from them. We're no longer in tune with them. We don't vibrate with them. Therefore, our universe is tuned to one frequency, our universe. But it means that probably there are other parallel universes in your living room. And believe it or not, this is called modern physics.
These reptilian entities seem to operate, and again, it's not just reptilian. There are, there are many different kinds of entities that do not have a human form that operate just outside of human sight, and history has recorded them as demons and all this stuff. Um, uh, but the reptilian um, part of it seems to be very significant to the controlling systems um, on the planet today. Uh, and they operate just outside of, of visible light. Therefore, we don't see them in the normal course of events. That's just basically like a ghost. When, when you're looking at a ghostly figure, um, most of them don't look solid because they're operating just outside of your frequency. Just enough for you to perceive something, but not enough for them to, to appear to be, uh, have solidity. Um, and uh, this is a very... My name is Kami, and I am indeed the guardian of this planet. But it wasn't always that way. Uh, what do you mean? Guardians are a mortal lot, much like you. There was a guardian before me, and I sensed that his end was approaching. I made the same trek that you did, up to this lookout hoping to become his successor. But he turned his back on me. In the beginning of Dragon Ball Z, Goku loses his life when he sacrifices himself so that he can kill his brother Raditz, another Saiyan or fallen angel who came to Earth to check to see if Goku completed his mission of destroying the planet. When Goku dies, we get to see what heaven is like. When Goku arrives to heaven, he's sent to a godlike figure named King Kai to get training so that he may return to Earth and save it. The only problem was Goku had to travel a long way down a road called Snake Way. Snake Way clearly looked like a dragon but was called Snake. Again, this is how you know the dragon Shinron is the serpent or devil which is also known as a snake. Along the way, Goku falls off Snake Way and he finds himself trapped in hell. When he gets to hell, it is represented as a not so bad place. It was actually pretty normal and probably would give an impressionable kid the thought that hell is nothing to fear. But you know, really, I mean, if 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 heaven is this place where people worship forever and hell is this place where all the the sinners are, are tortured forever, um, and it, it's, it seems to me that we've kind of established like a battle of the soul collectors. Yeah. So that God's trying to get as many as he can, only he doesn't seem to be making any effort at all to demonstrate that this yeah. is what he wants to do. And, and the Satan's trying to get all he can, uh, but uh, he's, he hates us and wants to torture us. I, it seems like the best thing that Satan could do if he wants to topple God, and I'm assuming that he's reasonably intelligent, um, is to, I don't know, step up on earth and say, hey everybody, I'm, uh, I'm Satan. Not nearly as bad as these guys have made me out to be, and uh, and I'm not going to torture you at all. Um, actually, all I need you to do is just uh, side with me in this little battle thing. We'll we'll hook you up downstairs. You can have your own. Uh, yeah, there's no there's no fire and brimstone and all this stuff. We've got you know there's beer a, there's and there's a big and, central fireplace. Yeah, you know you know we have barbecues. It's there a nice weekend, one where you can see through from room to room. Yeah, it's, it's been vastly cool. overblown. Yeah, and, you know, there's there's good food down there, and when you get there, you don't have to sit around and you know worship people and play harps and, and do all the this. Harp music gets real old, yeah. trust me. I mean, you know, wouldn't that be the quickest way? Oh, oh, yeah, everybody's going to be you know well fed, pleasant, and have a good time. I mean, if if your real goal is to win souls, and 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 people are as as base and immoral as as God seems to think they are. Yeah. That'd certainly be the quickest way. And as most believers seem to think they are. Yeah. They all assume that we are just rotten to the core. Oh, I was told, you so. know, just a few days ago that, um, that we're all sinners, including those Christians. Not so the most common Illuminati symbol exposed is the Eye of Horus. And Dragon Ball Z is no exception when it comes to using this symbolism. One of Goku's friends named Tien represents the One Eye symbolism. Even one of his moves uses the pyramid hand sign with his third eye illuminating a beam through the pyramid.
When Goku is wished back to Earth by the Dragon Balls, he is faced with an even more dangerous foe named Vegeta. Vegeta represents a yin-yang relationship with Goku. Vegeta is the prince of all Saiyans and is very angry all the time. He is the dark side of Goku, while Goku represents the light or a false light. This is shown more throughout the series as they go from bringing enemies to friends. Although Vegeta remains envious of Goku throughout the whole franchise. Dragon Ball Z was promoting conspiracy theories before YouTube existed. Hidden in plain sight but marketed as kids television. Sort of like this episode of the DuckTales created in 1989. I am Dr. Von Swine. And who are you? Scrooge McDuck. Scrooge McDuck? The wealthiest guy in Duckburg? I see. Well, I'm afraid you come to the wrong place. The mental health clinic for the screwballs is down the street, you see. I am not a screwball. Well, you are if you come to the free clinic thinking you are the richest duck in Duckburg. Who do you think I got to be the richest? No, what's wrong with me? Ahem, uh -huh. looks like a capital distortion causing an astigmatic lipitude in the myopic receptor. Sounds serious? Not really. It means I got sauerkraut on my monocle. <laughs> there! Now for a closer look. <gasps> Golden Strudel! The worst case of loot lice I ever seen. Loot lice? What's that? Oh. A rare malady that affects bankers, cashiers. After the Vegeta saga, we come across an even more evil foe by the name of Frieza. Although this character represents something larger than just being another great foe, it is often ignored by many Dragon Ball Z fans. Many Dragon Ball Z fans may not like what I'm about to say, but Frieza is a very powerful transgender. This character sits, stands, talks, walks, and straight up acts like a woman. This is so clear that I remember as a child me and my friends discussing whether or not we thought Frieza was a man or a woman. Now, the series makes it clear that Frieza is a male but clearly acts like an overpowerful female dog or bitch. Although many women play the voice of many male cartoon characters, I just wanted to add that Frieza is played by a woman. It's for the idiots that think Frieza is a female. Watch carefully, you faggot. You're as twisted inside as your brother. Full of hatred. Well, no more. You've dug your own grave. Really? Because after I kill you, I'm going to turn this planet and everyone on it into dust. No way! Not on my watch! Continuing on... After the Frieza saga, we find ourselves in the Android saga. The Android saga is used as a tool to not only promote the rise of machine, but it mainly promotes transhumanism. Dr. Jiro, a mad scientist, created the androids for one purpose, to destroy the Z fighters. Dr. Jiro literally merged himself with machine to make himself a more superior opponent. His companion, Android 19 and later introduced Android 16 were the only androids that he made that I believe were purely machine. The rest of the androids he made were once people merged with machine. This is a clear representation of transhumanism and if that isn't enough, the mad scientist Dr. Jerome did not stop with transhumanism. You monster! I cleared the area of innocence in accordance with your wishes. The doctor feared that the androids may not be enough, so he also experimented with cloning. Using the DNA of all the Z fighters, Dr. Jiro was able to create the perfect warrior that he named Cell. I don't need to dive into the details of the Cell saga because it's pretty much pointless for the point I'm trying to make. 
world's greatest fighters into one, and then cultivate that cell into a singular invincible entity. Unfortunately for the good doctor, however, he soon realized that his project was far too complex to be completed during his lifetime. As such, he diverted his attention to more immediate pursuits. But only after he had programmed his computer to finish the enormous task which he had begun. The computer worked tirelessly to complete the fusion of cells that had been gathered from the mightiest warriors ever to walk the Earth. Every major saga of Dragon Ball Z promotes some form of an Illuminati agenda. Here is what's important about the Cell Saga. In the Cell Saga, or the Clone Saga, I like to call it, we meet another character who becomes a main character in the show, a human martial arts champion by the name of Hercule. At least that's what they called him in the English dub version. In the original Japanese version, an uncut English version, his name is Mr. Satan. Although on the show he doesn't seem to have the personality of a mean devil, he actually takes on many characteristics of the devil. For one, he is a straight up liar and deceiver. He lied to get where he is. He literally has the masses worshiping him. With many episodes, you can hear crowds of people chanting Satan over and over again. He claims to be the strongest in the universe. Sound familiar? Like how the devil claims to be more powerful than God and his only agenda is to overthrow God by deceiving people that he is God. Now raise up those hands and lend me that energy so I can defeat Martian Vu. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh yeah, uh, nothing personal. Uh, I just don't think they would do it unless they thought it was me. And at this point, defeating Majin Buu is all that matters. Everyone! It's him! Mr. Huh? Satan! Yeah. Raise your oh, hands! Much. It's him, the champ! Yeah! That's it, man. Don't pull that. Give me everything you've got. got. Using his special powers, the world champion is speaking to the entire planet from a battle that we can't even see! This is fantastic! In the next saga, we meet Mr. Satan's daughter, whose name is Videl. It's not much to be said about this character, but you notice her name is spelled V-I-D-E-L. But if you rearrange the letters in her name, you come up with Devil, D-E-V-I-L. Also at this point in the series, you will notice that when the show goes on commercial and returns, there is a short scene when Videl is in the car with Gohan, who is the son of Goku. The car reads Mr. Satan, and also reads 666. If this isn't convincing enough that Dragon Ball Z is Illuminati propaganda, maybe this will convince you. The last saga, known as the Boo Saga, is about an evil wizard named Bobbity. Bobbity is taking the souls of the fighters that he can use them to collect the energy and revive an evil monster by the name of Boo. Later we learn the name of Bobbity's father which is, you guessed it, Bibbity. Bibbity, Bobbity, Boo. A clear reference to magic or sorcery which is banned by God. When a fighter sells his soul to Bobbity, they get a mark on their forehead, which is a huge letter M. M for Mason, M for Magic, M for Mark of the Beast. You decide. But do you think I'm crazy? According to Dragon Ball Wiki, the word Majin literally translates to demon or magic. What's interesting to note about this, Babidi literally hangs with the king of demons, Deborah 
who happens to look exactly as the devil most people in America depict him as. Imagine my shock to see the undeniable proof to discover that no matter how hard I tried, I would never be able to catch you. A warrior prince forever living in the shadow of a low-level clown. So that's when I secretly made up my mind. You mean you! You fool! You deliberately let yourself fall under Bobbity's spell! Yes, I saw the power of Bobbity's magic. At the World Martial Arts Tournament, those two henchmen, he said. The people who had seen those fighters in the previous tournament couldn't understand how they'd become so powerful. But you and I know, don't we? It was Bobbity's magic, and I knew that what his magic had done for those fighters, it could also do for me. I knew that if I allowed myself to fall under his control, the difference in our power would disappear. I'm quite pleased with the result. Even if they do come at a price. I'd say the end more than justifies the means. Vegeta, I don't understand. You've never allowed anyone to help you before in your life. Why start now? Why Bobbity? Because I wanted him to reawaken the evil in my heart. I wanted him to return me to the way I was before! <laughs> I was the perfect warrior, cold and ruthless. I lived by my strength alone, uninhibited by foolish emotion. But slowly, over the years, I became one of you, my quest for greatness gradually giving way to this life of mediocrity. I awoke one day to find that I had settled down, formed a family. I had even grown quite fond of them. Would you believe? I almost started to think the Earth was a nice place to live. Do you understand now, Kakarot? That's why I needed Bobbity to set me free by releasing the evil in my heart. He has freed me of these petty attachments. <laughs> and I'd have to say it feels pretty good. Do you really believe what you're saying? <laughs> Is all this merely coincidence or is it more than what we have been led to believe? I'm personally starting to no longer believe in coincidences. All this was done for a reason. This concludes my decoding of Dragon Ball Z and in the next video I will be decoding the Illuminati mysteries of Dragon Ball Super but first I want to hear your thoughts and opinions. Sound off in the comment section and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Dragon Ball Z decoded videos and more only on UPTV. This has been Devin with UPTV and I'll holla at y'all later. Peace. Thank you for watching Up TV. If you like this video and would love to see more, check out these great videos here. And don't forget to subscribe to Up TV and Up TV 2 for even more great videos. <laughs>